yeah. data. Uh, as far as I thought, I think you're all showing that you understand what, what you're doing, or at least where the gaps are. At least we know where the gaps are. So well done. I quite enjoyed this. OK. Yeah, me too. So this, um, so this is only from my part of the open report, and it's really not the feedback here is not so much about the science of the report; it's more about the the write-up and the critical analysis parts of the report, which is all <coughs> more relevant to what you're thinking about now. Okay. So just quickly to, to mention, so Greg and I have marked our things. We haven't reconciled our the moderating things. So you won't get the marks now, but they will be coming to you imminently. That makes kind of sense. But I thought it would be a good opportunity to get this, this feedback to you. Does this work? Yes, it does. Um, so quickly, uh, one of the things that, you know, the first thing that you read when you're reading a report is the title. Um, and some of these are some of the titles that you guys came up with in your reports. And they were all kind of really very similar. And the, your, your title was uh, basically describing the task that was given to you. Okay. Um, and that's fine, um, and it doesn't really matter that much, it's not like, massively weighted in terms of the mark scheme, but it's, it's quite a good idea to think a little bit more about your title, because that kind of like sets the tone for whoever's reading your report. Okay? And it's a good idea to think about, instead of you know, what task have you been given, but to so give the title is what have you actually found out. Okay? So for example here, you, your titles could have been something, you know, um, it reduced overturning in of lock in, in the future areas, or, you know, Increased anoxia in locative over the next hundred years. Something that would you know be more descriptive of the cycle and would perhaps interest a wider range of people. So just think about that. Um, and the other thing about the reports is quite a lot of them didn't have a very good structure in terms of the way that they were written. Um, so you don't have to have titles you know, or subtitles. You don't have to have you know introduction methods. You don't have to have accurate <coughs> nouns. It does help a lot if you do do that. Um, so you do kind of, it's more in terms of the actual order things are presented. Okay, so you start with like a justification of why you're doing it, and kind of most of you had that kind of section at the beginning. Um, and then you have kind of like you introduced like one part of, you know, the, the geographical setting. Um, and then it was really in this section here of how all the climate change that some of your structure start to break down. Okay, in terms of you, we're getting things kind of like, uh, not so much muddled up, but not in a very clear and logical order. Okay, so this is an uh, example of how I would have gone about it. So I would have started by maybe making this section of, of, of headings, right? So this is a lot, okay? And you don't have to have all of these things in here, so you don't you have to have a separate heading for temperature, a separate heading for precipitation. But you should write your paragraphs or sections in a logical order. So for instance, when we get to talk about you know, how the climate will change, you go through different lines of evidence, so the current climate, maybe the past climate, maybe the future climate, you go through them in the same order each time. Okay, so you have a nice logical structure that makes makes sense to the person's reading. Okay, if you jumped around different things, then it makes it a lot harder to read. Um, just just as a point here, also if you if you can have these numbered headings, okay, uh, it's quite easy to set that up in Word. Um, it really helps you refer to different places in the text. So one of the things that none of you guys did for the summary for policymakers is nobody referred back to the text. Okay? And if you have these, these headings, it's very easy to do that word communication automatically. Um, but yeah, so I would recommend that when you do your projects and write a project, you think about this kind of structure before you start writing to make sure that you're actually thinking about covering everything. Okay? And then you just fill in all of the gaps. You just write a couple of paragraphs for each of these headings. Makes it a lot, the flow of text a lot more um, manageable. Um, okay, so this, this says paragraphs up here underneath the recording thing. Another thing, stylistically wise, uh, was that quite a lot of you had uh, weren't rigorously st sticking to kind of one idea or one subject per paragraph. And that's what paragraphs are for. You group together sentences that are all about the same thing, that that paragraph discusses that kind of topic. Um, and it's a good idea to have a paragraph that begins with a sentence that, that, su that basically summarizes what that paragraph is about. Okay, this kind of does it. But you do this, this example here, it talks about basically what happened on the field trip. Okay? And then it jumps into describing stuff about the, the physical circulation of the lock. So it jumps between one subject, which is kind of talking about you know, the narrative of the field trip, and then jumping into another subject. 
Okay? So that makes reading it slightly confusing. You have to kind of you have to try it means it makes the reader has to put in more effort to read it. And that's kind of optimal. Um, okay, so this is uh, another thing that um, that I guess was kind of really quite important with the open reports. Um, so we can all talk about figures now. So this is um, this is a statement that somebody wrote in their project. Basically, to summarise all this, basically sea level rise. Okay, will change. Will increase mixing in the in the basin. Okay, which will reduce hypoxia and impact sedimentary chemistry. Okay, that's, that's basically what this person is trying to say. And they referred to Figure Two. Okay, um, so just think. See if you can remember. I hope this. Works. Okay, but yeah. So this is the figure that they referred to in that kind of thing. So that that kind of does show part of that kind of that statement about the ultimate end will be a change in manganese cycling. Okay. But is that the best figure that they could have used? Not only just to show this, okay, so think about you've got um, two panels which could have quite easily be combined into one panel, okay, and would have had both sets of data on the one panel, would have made it a lot easier to compare these two data sets together, okay. Um, perhaps you, know, you could have also included a panel that had a schematic of the lock to show kind of the distance along here, relates to where the sill is. Okay, so you need to think a lot more about how you can structure your figures okay, to, to focus on the thing that you're trying to demonstrate with that figure. Okay, and that's really, really important. Um, so this is another example of that. Um, so this is the kind of the statement that was made. So three main aspects of climate change can affect Oberlin. Um, uh, uh, the following figures, which are kind of where these are uh, described, uh, show how these different emission scenarios affect the future change. And got a table. I've got a figure down here uh, that's taken from one of the, the publications that you guys read. But I mean, this I mean it does show this. So we, we can look in here and see an over that sea level is rising. Okay. But it would have been. It makes no sense to have Glasgow, Liverpool, and Stornoway in there. So you could have made that a lot simpler by just cutting out bits of that table. Uh, you could have perhaps then just had over with three different mission scenarios. Okay, but you know, this kind of information would be much better shown as some kind of graph. Okay, maybe something like this. Uh, but then again, this one is not entirely um, great because this shows one scenario and the error bounds from that, which is great. Okay, but it doesn't show the different scenarios. So we could have made one graph that had scenarios with the error bars on, everything all in one kind of panel that we could have compared to each other. Okay, um, and the last bit of this is basically this, this ask critical analysis. What does it mean? Well, somehow it looks on a timer. No, that's what you keep that's that's a smart board here. If you touch oh, the, oh, I touched the screen. Okay. <coughs> so I was going to not. <coughs> I was going to not um, not show you this and ask you what you guys think critical analysis analysis means. Okay, um, and it would have been passed out to staff in. So <laughs> what do you think critical analysis means? If we all have the same idea. Um, but, but basically, it's taking some data, or an idea, or somebody else's interpretation, or your interpretation, and then taking that and assessing it for robustness, so how valid is that idea, listing kind of some of the assumptions that it makes, and how important are those assumptions. Okay? So these are some examples from the... Um, Reports, I mean, this is kind of, I, know, I can't remember who did this one, so I won't kind of add to them, but this is kind of the worst example of critical analysis. Okay? They've made some kind of assessment of you know, uh, these predictions, are they good or bad, rather than saying they are just some predictions. But they're saying, well, the predictions, I'm not going to trust the predictions because they're predictions. Okay? There, might, there might be those predictions are particularly untrustworthy or not very valid, but you should really start to outline the reasons why those are bad. So, are they using a limited set of models? Okay, have they used the wrong kind of like um, or inappropriate um, emission scenarios? Okay, so think about we want to see reasoning behind whether you're kind of like uh, beating down on some kind of uh, data set or ideas. Okay, so these kind of like, um, slightly more uh, slightly more appropriate <coughs> at the bottom. This is kind of one of the areas that you can really demonstrate your kind of like worth as a scientist. We really want to see you taking some data sets, some ideas, and, and really assessing them for 
whether they're robust, whether they're <coughs> sensible, whether they make good assumptions. That's the point. So this is uh, an example uh, from, from Etiv. So this is going quite a lot of you wrote about sea level rise, which is you know, totally normal thing to do. Um, and we've got this compounded effect of um, uh, global sea level rise going up and, uh, and the land also rising up, so you get this competing effect. Okay, so uh, mean absolute sea level rise is, is 93 centimetres, um, but it's not representative of Scotland because of this up. Okay, so that's, that's kind of like the first kind of level of critical analysis. You've got something, and you've said why that's wrong. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, but then we can say, well, you know, how 93 centimetres, that's like depressingly precise, right? So what are the additional uncertainties that have gone into that? How does that potentially compare to other estimates of sea level rise over the next century? What has the IPCC, or UK Climate Impact Program, what have they missed out in that? Okay, so if you went into that extra level of detail and you know, started to look at the individual numbers and say, you know, what's, what's potentially wrong with those, that would be, that would be really good. Um, and yeah, and again, um, another example, so quite a few of those you wrote about the impact of biodiversity on the lock, um, and you, know, you said oh, any change would be bad. Okay? But you could go and maybe look at how you know, globally biodiversity changes with, for instance, salinity here. So if we change salinity, we might change biodiversity. But if we are actually kind of somewhere here in Locative, we get maybe more saline, more water coming in. We might actually increase our marine species, the overall biodiversity goes up. But then a level of critical analysis you can bring in is, you know, does that matter? Is it just total numbers of species that matter, or is it actually these kind of like key kind of estuarine species that are critical for kind of what we think of as the health of the ecosystem? So there are a whole bunch of different kind of levels that you can apply this critical analysis to in terms of testing the data, testing the assumptions that go into models, but also testing or um, criticizing you know, the concepts even in terms of you know, what is the value of biodiversity. Okay? Is it that we care about them because they provide some intrinsic kind of like function, the ecosystem service, or you know, are we worried about them just because you know, it's good to have biodiversity for its own sake? So this critical analysis works across a whole range of different aspects of report writing, from data collection, interpretation, but then also kind of application to this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's um, that's it.